Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much. Rowdy crowd today. Man, you guys are kind of excited. Good to see you here. Welcome, welcome. All right. Find a seat and fill it. Great to have all of you here. I want to say a special welcome. Uh, first time guests. We also have some out of town guests here. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. I hope you'll come back and be with us uh, any and every opportunity that you have. There is a very unusual sign at a remote crossing up on the northern border of the U.S. going into Canada. Now, what makes this sign unusual is where it's located. It's actually located on a dirt road. And, and this dirt road, as it goes north into Canada, as it crosses the border, it forks in several different directions. But every single one of the forks on those dirt roads has deep ruts cut into that dirt road. And the ruts literally continue, as you're standing there at this sign, the ruts literally continue as far as the eye can see. But what makes the sign so unusual is what it says. Pick your ruts carefully, you will be in them for miles. You ever found yourself in a rut? You know, we're all, we're all tempted. We all have a tendency to get stuck in ruts. And ruts have a way of controlling us and confining us. And sometimes can do so for miles and miles as far as the eye can see. Now, if we don't learn how to get out of these negative ruts in our lives, we're never going to be able to grow into the people God created us to be. We'll never be able to mature uh, in our personality, uh, the way God wants us to grow up in life. Ruts. Now, you know, as I look about at, at these kind of negative ruts in our lives, generally speaking, the ruts we get trapped in and stuck in, generally speaking, have two sources. First of all, it's mistakes made by us. Have you ever made a mistake, uh, you know, made a bad decision, a bad choice, and it kind of puts you in a rut? And, and, it, and it really confined you and controlled you for maybe years in your life. Uh, maybe you made a mistake, a bad choice, and you said, you know, I'm a, I failed, I'm a failure. I'll never be able to succeed in this area. I'll never be able to be different. You know, really, I've always been this way, and I'll be this way until the day I die. There's no hope for me to ever be transformed and to be changed. Mistakes made by us. The second source is mistakes made by others. You see, sometimes we can actually get stuck in a rut, and we didn't choose the rut. Maybe we had parents who made bad decisions. And the decisions they made had a ripple effect. And here we are, innocent children, but we kind of got stuck in a rut as well. So parents can do things like, uh, why can't you be more like your brother? Why can't you be more like your sister? Hmm? And so we begin to think, well, I'll never be anything. And so we get stuck in this emotional rut. I know for some of you, you've told me your stories. It was teachers, coaches, influential people in your life that spoke negative words into your life, and they stuck. And then they got you stuck in a rut. Uh, you don't have what it takes. You'll never succeed. You'll never accomplish anything. You'll never go to college. You'll never get a good job. And then, and this is the one I hate to admit, very often it's mistakes made by pastors and churches. Some of you grew up in dysfunctional churches, did you not? Some of you had pastors. They shouldn't have been in the pulpit. They should have been in therapy. <laughs> and so they put words into your heart, things like you're not good enough. You need to do more. You need to give more, read more, pray more, serve more. Uh, you just don't measure up. Boy, and there's the phrase. You don't measure up. You let that 
phrase sink deep into your spirit, it'll paralyze you for miles and miles as far as the eye can see. Get in that rut and you will find yourself looking in the mirror saying to yourself, I could never measure up. I could never be accepted. I could never be forgiven. I could never belong or be included. I could never, never be different than the person I am today. In 10, 20, 30 years, I'll be the same person I am. There is no hope for change. For the next eight weeks, we're going to learn how to break free. We're going to learn how to break free of these ruts, these negative feelings that prevent growth, that prevent transformation that God wants to bring about in our lives. Now, I don't want you to think for a moment that this sermon series is going to be like some kind of self-help psychology, okay? We're not talking about that. We're not going to look at your feelings and do a little psychology on your feelings. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to apply the Word of God to the negative feelings that for some of you have controlled and still are controlling your lives every day. They're influencing your relationships. They're influencing your marriage. They're influencing your parenting skills. They, they influence how you treat people at work or in the neighborhood or even at church. But from the Word of God, God is going to teach us how to break free from these debilitating, paralyzing ruts in which we very often can get stuck. Now, today we're going to look at the first rut. All right, are you ready? Here's the first rut when I don't feel good enough. Now, this is especially dangerous when we apply it to our relationship with God. So think back in your own life. Have you ever looked at your past and said, I've just made too many mistakes. I have wrecked my life. I have sinned too much. I could never, ever have a meaningful relationship with God. I'm too far gone. I have too many addictions. I have too many problems. I have too many issues that I'm having to deal with. I could never, ever be good enough for God. Are you stuck in that rut? Boy, talk about a dangerous rut. This attitude will prevent you from ever finding and fulfilling God's unique purpose and plan of transformation in your life. But God has a solution. Guys, he has a solution. He has a way out of this rut. Now, here's the big, hairy Bible word, justification. There's God's solution to when we say, I don't feel good enough for God. We're going to look at justification today. As Paul describes it in Romans chapter 5. So if you want to follow along in your Bibles, um, find Romans chapter 5. What do we do? What do we do to break out of this rut? How can we break free when we feel like we could never be good enough for God? Here's where we start. Number one. You need to understand the gift of justification. Remember, you know, the Apostle Paul says we're going, to be, we're going to be transformed by the what? Romans 12. By the renewing of our mind. The first thing you have to do, you've got to understand truth. You've got to understand the truth, the depth, God's definition of justification. So let's understand the gift of justification for a moment. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Let's say it together. It's on the screen. Join me. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the word justified. Very important word. When you look, do the, the, the research and dig into what did the word justification mean in the first century in the life of Paul, here's what you learn. It was a legal term. So the first thing you have to imagine is you're in a courtroom. You have been found guilty of a crime. Not just accused. You are one guilty dog. Okay? You're guilty. You have found guilty of breaking God's law. Here's the problem. You have no way to pay the fine. Someone else has got to pay the fine for your crime. 
Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sin. He picked up the tab. He paid the debt you owed. That's justification. And as I mentioned last week, and I put it in your notes today, justified means just as if I'd never sinned. So think about that. Justified means I can stand before God just as if I had never sinned. Had I sinned? Absolutely. I'm guilty. But the good news is that Jesus Christ pays for my sin. Let me, let me illustrate this. Most of us know that the President of the United States has the power to give presidential pardons. Now, the person may be guilty of a crime, not just accused, absolutely guilty of a crime, but that does not matter. The president has the authority to pronounce a presidential pardon over a person. Once that happens, ladies and gentlemen, that person is free of that crime. Though they were found guilty, they may have been, even been in prison serving the sentence, but when the president pronounces a presidential pardon, that person is free to go. That crime has been removed from their record. Do you understand that Jesus Christ has done that for you? By his sacrifice on the cross, when his blood was shed, he became the perfect lamb of God. His blood, perfect blood, shed for you, made atonement, made peace with God, allowed you to be justified. Now, you got to understand, uh, you were not acquitted. You know the difference between being acquitted and pardoned? Acquitted means we thought you did it, but you didn't. Sorry. That's acquittal. Pardon means you did it, we know you did it, you know you did it, but we're going to forgive you anyway. You have been pardoned. Okay? Don't ever think you've been acquitted by God. Oh, no, you're guilty. We've all broken God's law. No one is righteous. Absolutely no one. And yet Jesus Christ has made payment. So think about this. Have you ever said, are you saying today, God could never forgive somebody like me? I've blown it. I, I got my life off track so bad I've been in the ruts. There's no way God could ever forgive me. Not true. God has provided a way out of this rut out of the, I could never measure up, right? And it's the word justification. Do you understand? Under, do you understand the incredible, incredible gift of justification? Okay, if you do, we're ready to go to number two. Or do I need to back up and go one more time? We're good? All right, now let's look at number two. Let's build on that. Here's the second thing you must do. Accept the gift of justification. Now, this is a step some of you in the room may not have ever made. What does Paul say? I want us to read Romans 5, 1 again. We're going to emphasize something else here. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Two very important facts we need to understand about justification. Write these down. Number one, it is an accomplished fact. Your justification is an accomplished fact. That's why you'll notice it's in the past tense. You have been justified. This is something that happened in the past. It has been accomplished. And the results of that continue for the rest of your life. We have been justified. This, this is life-changing. Once you understand that you, you're not working for a position of justification, you are working from a position of justification. You have been justified, so you live the rest of your life from this new position of being justified just as if I'd never sinned. My friend, that will change your relationship with God. You're, you're not trying to earn something that has been freely given to you. Now that brings us to the second important fact about justification. Number two, it is a gift received by faith. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. Our justification is not a position that we earn. It is a gift that we receive. This will change your relationship with God forever. Once you understand that you are justified by believing, not achieving. 
Now, let me illustrate. Uh, yesterday was Valentine's Day at my house, and uh, I gave Mary a gift. Actually, I gave her several. Actually, one of them was a get-even gift. <laughs> I've, been, I've been waiting for years for this. Now, you got to know my wife, and she's real practical. And like, uh, one of her favorite things to do, can I tell this story? Yeah, now that I've told God and everybody, it, like you're going to say no? Yeah. She loves to shop at places like Staples and Office Mac because she loves office stuff. Like if you want to bless her, give her a staple, you know. <laughs> if you really want to go over the top, give her a stapler. I mean, she just loves office stuff, and she always has. Uh, so true story, one year... She wraps up this big box. Valentine's Day. We're talking romantic Valentine's Day. Big box, beautiful bow, I unwrap it. Guess what it is? Valentine's Day. Did I mention this was a Valentine's gift? She gave me a paper shredder. <laughs> now, you know, guys, that's like, you know, when you gave your sister a football because you knew you'd get to play with it. Guess who loves zzz, zzz, she just loves to grind paper, just loves to do it, makes her day. I have been waiting, probably a decade, I have been waiting for the perfect time to get even. So here's what I did yesterday. I got this really beautiful gift bag. I mean, it's kind of like opaque and had beautiful roses on the front. And I wrapped up the, the get even gift, you know, wrapped it up in, in red Valentine red, tissue paper. And actually, you know how you take extra tissue gals and you kind of, you grab it in the middle and you shake it and then you put it in, you make it poof out the top. I learned that. I learned how to do that. So you make it poof out. I mean, it was a beautiful gift. Uh, she probably thought it was from Bullock's. It was wrapped so beautifully. She opened it up. <clears throat> Guess what I got my get even gift. She opened it up. It was one of these little things where you check batteries, it's a battery checker to see, <laughs> to see if batteries are good. And you, man, it's cool, you can use three, you know, triple A, double A batteries, the little nine volt. It's got all these buttons on there and you can check it and it's got a little meter. I want you to know, I have never, I have never seen her so romantic in my life. I'm telling you, I scored great points, ladies and gentlemen, so. Now, I want you to imagine. Imagine yesterday, I give Mary this gift. And really, she, you got to know her. I'm talking Office Max, Staples. That's, she'd rather go there than Macy's, okay? I gave her this gift. She's really thrilled. I gave her some other stuff. She kind of like put it aside. She wanted to play with her battery charger. Now, can you imagine after she has this euphoric moment with this gift that I gave her, can you imagine if she went over, picked up her wallet and said, Rick, I love this. You know I love things like this. Thank you so much. How much, it, how much was it? I want to pay you for it. <laughs> Can you imagine? My heart would be broken. I said, Mary, I've been planning this for 10 years. <laughs> this is my get even. Don't rob me of this moment. Can you imagine if she would have tried to pay me for that gift? I would have been hurt. I would have been insulted. And I guarantee you, I would have rejected her offer to pay. How many times do you think we insult God when we try to pay for our salvation? When we try to be good enough to earn God's favor? How do you think God feels? God's going, are you kidding? I gave my son to die on a cross for your salvation. You're trying to pay for it with your puny righteousness, with your puny efforts of meriting my gift? How about this? How about we respond to God like Mary responded to me? She hugged me and said, thank you. I absolutely love it. It's called gratitude. Learn to accept the gift of justification. I know I'm pounding on this, guys, because I know some of you, you have, you have trouble accepting a gift. I don't know why. Somewhere in your past you got screwed up and you don't know how to say thank you. You don't know how to accept a gift. You always want to pay. So if somebody does something for you, you want to pay them back and then a little more. 
And that's okay in a relationship, but you got to be careful if you carry that over into your relationship with God. Bad things happen. Because pretty soon you begin to say, hey, I'll tell you what, God, I'll cut a deal with you on my salvation, on this justification thing. Let's cut a deal. Uh, 50-50. I'll let Jesus build half of the bridge, and then I'll build half of the bridge. Hey, God, we'll meet in the middle. God says, I'm not interested in that kind of flimsy bridge. Okay, God, I'll tell you what, uh, 80-20. We'll do 80-20. You do 80, I'll do 20. God says, it's either all or nothing. You either let me play, pay completely for your salvation or the offer's off the table. But God, I can't, I, it's, it's all or nothing. Now are you ready to open up your hands and say, Lord, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Nothing. What's nothing? Zippo, nada. You have nothing. You have no righteousness to give God. It is his gift to you. So have you ever said, I could never have a relationship with God. I'm not good enough. I could never measure up. You know what? You're exactly right. You aren't good enough. You never would be good enough, never will be good enough to measure up. But praise God, that's not how you get right with God. Aren't you glad? That's not how you get right with God. Justification comes when we trust in what Christ has done for us, not in what we can do for Christ. We must accept completely, no strings attached. We must accept the gift of righteousness. There's the third truth. And this is the best. Enjoy the gift of justification. In the rest of our passage, the Apostle Paul describes the incredible benefits that we enjoy daily since we have been justified by our faith in Christ. So here's the deal. As we work through these, I want to show you three or four of these, I think four, uh, benefits, wonderful benefits you receive when you're justified. Some of you in this room, you've accepted Christ. You have been justified by your faith. So I want to review the benefits. Others of you, if you've never accepted Christ, I want you to know the offer that God's putting on the table. Uh, I'll admit I'm prejudiced. I'm biased. I don't think you ought to leave here today without accepting his offer. But hey, that's me. You know, you got to make up your own decision. But... Look at these benefits. Are you ready? Number one, you have peace with God. Peace with God. I know we've read verse one twice, but we're going to read it one more time. Chapter five, verse one, look what it says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This means the war is finally over between you and God. Sin creates division, disharmony, enmity, separation. It's like a wedge driven in our relationship with God. The good news is when we're justified, the wedge is removed. We're, we're back in harmony with God, so the war is over. We have peace with God. Oh, by the way, you know what the ripple effect here is? We also begin to have peace with each other. Because see, if I've got peace with God and you have peace with God we can kind of quit fighting each other and we can kind of relax and just enjoy each other in the family of God. And an amazing thing happens when I have peace with God and I have peace with you. I sure have a lot of peace inside also. And so peace begins to control every aspect of our lives. There's a second benefit. I love this one. You get access to God. Access to God. Romans 5.2, the first part of 5.2. Through whom, talking about Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now, what? Stand. Don't you love that permanent word, stand? So we have access. Imagine how excited you would be if you uh, went to a concert 
of your favorite singer or your favorite band and you went up to the window to pick up your ticket at the will call and they said, oh, by the way, you have been randomly selected for a backstage pass. Can you imagine? And I mean, and you open it up and it's like this ticket thing that you've never seen one. I mean, it's gold and embossed and it's a backstage pass and you just show that ticket and they go, come right through, come right through. You get to go backstage, you get to meet all the singers, all the people in the band. You get to see how the whole thing works. You just think you died and went to heaven. You have what? Access. Did you hear what Paul said? Because you have been justified, you now have access. What, backstage? No, where? You have access into the grace of God. That's amazing. This wonderful unmerited favor that we all need but none of us deserve, you now have Backstage access. Our sin once separated us from God. Now we have access into the very presence of God. Every day, not just Sunday from 9 to 10, 15, you have access to God. It's called prayer. You can pray. You can open up your heart. You can listen to God. God wants to have a relationship with you. You have access to God. All right, let's look. Next one, peace with God, access to God. Here's the third one. You have hope from God. Anybody need hope? Man, what's the news? We need hope. Our world is hopeless. We need hope. What kind of hope do we get? I love, I love Paul's honesty here. Middle of verse two through four, look at this. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, what? Hope, there it is again. Amazing. We don't lose hope. Even when life dumps on us, even when trials and suffering hit, why? Because we know God is still in control. He is working behind the scenes, working in all things for good. So when trials hit, when sufferings hit, what's God doing? He's just growing you. He's developing your character and your perseverance. I know some of you right now are going, I've had about all the character I can stand lately. But let's be honest, when do you grow the most? Yeah, you grow, you grow when you're going through the tough times. But be aware that you have hope because God has a purpose. He's got a plan. He's bringing you through those sufferings to a greater place of maturity. You know what he's actually doing? He is changing you. He is transforming you from one degree of glory to another. He's transforming you from the inside out. This is why biblical hope is not wishful thinking. No, no. The biblical hope is confident expectation. You know the difference. Wishful thinking is, I sure hope I win the lottery. That's wishful thinking. Yeah, confident expectation is, God loves me. He has called me to be a member of his family. And no matter what happens, he's in control. And someday I die and go to heaven. How about that? Confident expectation. We have hope. Now here's the fourth benefit of being justified. You get love from God. Not from some angel. No. Not from some committee. No. From God. For God so loved the world that he did not send a committee. <laughs> Romans chapter 5 verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame. Oh. Some of your translation says, hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out where? Into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, 
Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. What a passage. Christ died for us. Let me read the rest of it, verse 9. Since we have now been, what, justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Amazing. God demonstrated his love for us by sending Jesus to die for enemies. Because of God's love, we're now his friends. We're forgiven. I love to tell the story about a father who was trying to teach his young son the concept of God's grace. But for whatever reason, the father was having trouble getting it, getting it down on his son's level. Until one day, the son got in trouble and the punishment for what the son did was a spanking. So his father took him into the back bedroom and explained, okay, you know what you did was wrong and you know the punishment for this one is a spanking. And the little boy looked up at his daddy and said, Daddy, I want grace, I want grace. And the father, seizing this moment, said, okay, you want grace? Grace you will have. What you did was wrong. And the punishment is a spanking. And that punishment can't go away. Somebody's got to pay for that violation. So here, son, and he handed his belt to his son and said, you administer the punishment to me. That, my son, is grace. Do you understand? God can't take our sin, sweep it under the carpet as if it never happened. No, that's not the way his perfect righteous universe has been designed. When we sin, someone has got to pay. Jesus says, let me do it for you. Jesus does not offer us cheap grace that costs him nothing. Now, his grace is free to us, but not to him. It cost him everything. It cost him his life. He took the punishment we deserved. So here's my question. Are you enjoying the wonderful benefits of your justification? Or are you still saying, well, there's just no hope for me. I could never measure up. Are you missing out on the wonderful benefits because you're still trying to climb that mountain? Earn it yourself. God has provided a way out of the rut. Enjoy the wonderful gift of justification. I had a moment the other day. I was, I was uh, walking through a store and I saw, hadn't seen one in years, the old Etch-A-Sketch. How many of you remember the red Etch-A-Sketch? Remember those? I, I thought those went out, you know, when I was a kid in the dark ages. But they're actually still around. And I went over, hadn't seen one in years, and I picked it up. And it brought back so many memories. Remember the Etch-A-Sketch? You know, you'd lay it flat and it had two knobs and you could spin it like this and you could draw and you could write. But it was a little bit hard, especially making those curved lines. You had to get the bend just right. But the good news about an Etch-A-Sketch is when you messed up, it wasn't eternal. All you do is pick it up, turn it upside down, and remember, just give it a shake and somehow, magically, all of your mistakes disappeared. And you, and you got to start over. Well, today at Grace is called Etch-A-Sketch Sunday. Every time we sin, our sin is engraved. It doesn't go away. It's there. And we can try to turn in the knobs. You can try to back up the knob to erase it doesn't erase. It just makes it worse. There's only one answer. 
Somebody's got to pick it up and shake it. Somebody's got to pick you up today and shake you. And I really pray that the grace of God will shake you today to the very core. That you'll never be the same again. That you will realize today you can turn the knobs of your life all day long and you will not fix your problem. You will wake up tomorrow in the same rut that you are in today. There's only one hope. Let Jesus Christ erase. Let him shake you upside down so that maybe for the first time you can be right side up and truly live your life in the way God designed you to live. Today, Jesus Christ invites you to be justified. He died on the cross for people like us who could never in a million years measure up, but we sure can be justified by the sacrifice of Christ. I'm telling you guys, once you understand justification, accept it as a free gift and spend the rest of your life enjoying the incredible benefits. So, have you been thinking... I could never measure up. I could never be good enough for God. Now we know the answer. We know God's answer. Now it's time to break free. Let's bow. Father, I want to conclude this morning by praying for two groups in the audience. First, I want to pray for those who have been justified, but Lord, maybe they have forgotten the incredible benefits. Maybe uh, you got them out of the ruts and on the road of salvation, but they find themselves back in some of the old ruts of their past. God, I pray today they would break free and get back on the road of salvation, enjoying the justification that you have freely given to us. Father, the second group I pray for are those in the room that have never really been justified. They're just uh, going through life in the same old ruts, thinking they could never be different. Father, would you uh, do me a favor? Would you give them hope? Give them hope today that they really can be changed. They can be different. Life can be made new. And Lord, I pray that I pray that just as we have done playing with an etch a sketch, that you would shake them, Lord, remove their sin, make them clean and clear, so they can have a do-over in life, so that they can be born again, start a new life, just as if I'd never sinned. Amen. God bless you.